Okay, hello. So here we are back again. Um, I don't know if you guys, I uh, missed a want uh, me to keep recording with Monty or not. Uh, please let me know if you do or not. Um, <laughs> so this week I didn't have him with me for the recording. Um, he'll make guest appearances on occasion. So what's going on today? Day. Uh, let me go over a couple of things I've opened up to show you. So we've got week three. We're on classification and taxonomy this week. So we're, that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, now that we've gotten off of Charles Darwin a bit, now we're going to hit Aristotle and other people who are quite interesting. So we're covering in your book, chapter 26. Um, you have one Labster Lab. You may have four videos um because it occurs to me that there's a crash course that i want to add into so you're going to get two amoeba sister videos one crash course video and one um uh, bozeman science with mr anderson um other things uh so here's the labster lab here's the two of them up right now i've got to get the other two up so they'll be up at least by the end of wednesday if not hopefully today um these things are hidden for a moment uh your weekly exam I'll, or quiz yeah, weekly exam yeah okay weekly quiz will be up as well and i'll put some more resources down here for you to check out if you so choose um so they should be up uh if not by the end of the day by wednesday at the very least so the rest of that is coming so just give me a minute i'm still working on how to make things more interactive and uh more interesting including uh, a dichonomous key uh, thing I would like to do with you. And I'm trying to figure out how to make it so it's not just a piece of paper. Um, uh, it would be something that you would actually interact with. So I'm trying to see if that's possible. Hopefully that assignment will be up by the end of Wednesday. Uh, so you will have time to get these things done. It's just, I'm trying to make them more robust and less uh, crazy. So anyway, that's my thoughts on what's going on for this week and what you should be looking out for. So yeah, there should be two more videos, interactive videos coming. Also, thank you so much to those of you that emailed me and messaged me over the weekend. I seriously do mean that um, for pointing out the problems and the uh, things that I, I messed up on because um, that helps me go in and uh, fix things, even though I know if, if I hope not. I'm not giving you a panic attack. I do see your messages over the weekend. It's just remember I am with my family. So I like to wait until Monday morning so I can, you know, get to everything. So um, I should have replied to everybody. If I didn't, I'm sorry. I'm getting, I'm working on through that. So yeah, if there's, there's still problems or uh, issues popping up, please, 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 um, you know, let me know and um, I'll get back and try to fix those as soon as I can. Um, so today, so let's get on to it. Get on with it. Get on with it. So today, I don't know if moving myself around will helps or even does anything. So anyway, today we're going to talk about classification, taxonomy, uh, dichonomous keys, and phylogeny. So anyway, um, and that is this. We're, as humans, we've always, always, always enjoyed as a species trying to put things in their place, so to speak. And I meant, I don't mean in a bad way. I mean, like, we like to organize things. Um, even if my house you know, it's like, you know, I organize things differently than my mother organizes things. She's she's a neat freak. I'm kind of more laissez-faire about it in the fact that, yeah, my it looks like a bunch of piles, but they're organized piles because I know what's in those piles. And if you rearrange my piles, then I can't find anything. So, yeah, I'm a messy organizer, but dang it, <laughs> I know where they are. They're in the piles. So, uh, but whereas my mother would come in and go, oh my God, it's a freaking wreck in here. And she'd go in and rearrange everything, which she did to me when I uh, was in the hospital giving birth to my son. She went into my apartment, couldn't stand it anymore and rearranged my apartment on me. Thanks. So uh, the added thing of coming home with a newborn baby, uh, yeah, 
I couldn't find anything, which was so helpful. Not anyway. Ugh, mothers. Anyway. Anyway, 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 anyway. So let's talk about one of the most famous guys who really want to categorize everything, and that is our man right here, Aristotle. So more than 2,000 years ago in ancient Greece, there was a philosopher and naturalist named Aristotle, and he pops up a lot in biology because he actually put down some thoughts on biology. He also was one of the ones that first, you know, proposed the concept of the atom that we, we can't, you know, break something down past a certain point, but it's hard to get to that certain point. Um, so he also sat there and said, you know what, we need to start grouping things, living things according to their similarities. Um, unfortunately, he kind of split it in a weird way, he decided to split into land, sea, and air, and he split plants into trees, shrubs, and um, grasses, I think. And it was like, yeah, but nothing really does live in the air. Oh no, it was trees, shrubs, and herbs. That's what he, that's what he did. Herbs. So anyway, but yeah, nothing, nothing, but nobody lives in the air. You know, birds fly through the air, but they land at night. You know, I mean, uh, so yeah, and I'm sure somebody pointed that out and he yelled at him. Anyway. So other Greeks and Romans picked up on this and started putting animals and plants into basic groups. And um, these groups, uh, and we this is where Latin pops in, are called genus or genera in the plural form. And hence science and classifying and naming organisms is called taxonomy. Not to be confused with taxidermy, that's taking an animal and putting it full of sawdust and making it look not dead, sort of. Unless you've seen some bad tax taxidermies, which I have seen. And yeah, there's a very sad looking lion. One of them that was making the rounds on um, Facebook a, a, a bit back. But anyway, so yeah, so taxidermy is not what we're talking about. Taxonomy is definitely what we're talking about. So when people name organisms, we use Latin. And because the reason we use Latin in science, if you didn't know, um, is because it's a dead language. It doesn't have any slang terms, which is really, really good when we're trying to definitely talk about an animal and we're trying to talk about it across a language barrier. Like I'm trying to talk to a Japanese scientist now um, and I'm sitting and he doesn't uh, speak English, he or she, and um, I'm sitting there going, you know, I'm talking about the, the uh, copperhead. You know, I use the Latin name so that way, you know, he knows I'm talking about a copperhead because a copperhead, interestingly enough, does have a lot of different uh, slang terms for uh, its name. We call it the copperhead around here, but there is a county in North Carolina that calls it papa leaves because apparently, you know, copperheads like to hide under leaf litter and um, they'll, they'll shake their tail. Uh, most snakes actually shake their tail instinctively, even if they don't have a rattle when they're scared. And when a co uh, copperhead's underneath leaf litter, it will shake its tail and uh, rattle the leaves. So it lets you know it's there and it doesn't want to be stepped on. But because of this, uh, there's one county that literally calls them papa leaves because of that papa leaf. Um, and it was interesting because it threw a, a biologist for a loop because he was studying copperheads and he kept hearing about this other snake called papa leaves in this one area of North Carolina. And he went and it was just copperheads. It was just under a different name. He thought he was gonna discover a whole new species of snake and come to find out, no, that's not what happened. So this is the reason why we use Latin and why we use the scientific names for these guys. Because uh, you know we wanna make sure that everybody's talking about the same creature, whether it be copperhead papa leaf, you know, that's why we use its Latin name in science. It's just easier so we all know what the heck we're talking about. And without 
you know, slang terms because uh, living languages gather slang terms. And I mean, di uh, Webster's Dictionary every year puts in new slang terms and gosh knows, you know, hello, TikTok and the internet has definitely sped that up. For, for instance, my son comes home all the time saying something and I have to sit there and go, what is that? And I usually have to turn around and, you know, before when I was teaching high school, I'd walk into my classroom and ask my high school students, okay, my son just said this, what does that mean? <laughs> and they have to go, oh, okay, let me explain, Ms. Royal. And I'm like, thank you. So that happens a lot, um, you know, like from the game Among Us, taking the word suspicious and now it's called sus, you know, that the person is being very sus, uh, just to give an example, uh, hopefully that doesn't make everybody cringe but that's the first thing that came up popped off the top of my head see living languages we get slang terms dead languages no slang terms therefore we don't have to sit there and go well is a papa leaf a whole new snake or is it a copperhead you see where i'm getting hopefully um so now one of the reasons this is also the reason why physicists hate biologists is because we come up with these funky names. Um, it's actually kind of funny because um, I, I've seen uh, interviews with, um, oh gosh, now I can't think of his name. Ah. Famous physicist, always on TV, brain dying, protege, or uh, yeah, the protege of Carl Sagan. It's going to come to me. It's my brain is being dumb right now. That's why I always need somebody. Is anybody here with me? No, it's just me. Okay. Somebody isn't popping up in a minute. It'll come to me. Anyway. Because I have some funny stories of, of him. What? Okay. Anyway. Now I've got it. Neil deGrasse Tyson, told you it would come to me. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I have seen in person. Very funny guy. Um, amusing. Yeah, he, he, he goes on a rant in one of his interviews about how biologists name craziness. And that's true, we do. And it used to be even worse than it is now, which I'm not sure if he's aware of or not. Biologists used to be horribly crazy named. And let me explain how that works. So Basically, there was a problem. Every time we discovered a new uh, organism, especially if they were closely related, we just kept adding more Latin descriptors to the name. So the name kept getting psychotically longer and longer and longer and longer. And some scientific names consisted of 12 or more Latin words, which is why they're called polynomials. And let me get my pointer out. Pointer. There we go. So polynomials, poly means many, nomial means naming. So it got to the point where the scientific name, and this is just an example of the European honeybee, which is the predominant honeybee that we have all, the, all over the United States and all over the world that makes honey. Uh, this is the honeybee. Um, so check out how long this name is for just one tiny bee. So Apis pubescens, Thoracae subgrisio, Adamine fuchsia, uh, Pedibus posticis, Glabus uh, untricae, uh, Margin cital, cital, yeah, wait, cil ciliatus, ciliatus, excuse me. Oh, say that five times fast. Yeah, right. Anyway, it was getting ridiculous. It was like, so we, every time we, we, you know, we had the European honeybee, we'd discover a new bee. So we'd slap another descriptor on the end of European honeybee. So that way we'd know the difference between the two in Latin. But can you imagine trying to write that out in a paper? And back then, you know, it wasn't like we had computers. Everything was done by hand. I'm sorry, but nobody got time for that. And that's what finally one guy broke. And he just said, nobody got time for that. And that guy that said that is Carl Linnaeus, except he said it in Swedish because he was Swedish. Anyway, so the guy that saved us from these ridiculously long names and guy that really loved to organize way too much was this guy, Carl Linnaeus. So anyway, um, so in the 1750s, he decided, let's guys, let's break this down and introduce a simpler naming and classifying system called binomial nomenclature. And uh, we thank him because binomial means uh, two 
by means two, nomial means name, and nomenclature means, you know, naming system. So two name, naming system. Woo! So the unique uh, two-part name for a species is now referred to a species scientific name. So the U uh, European honeybee's name is just Apis milfuria. So from that to that. Is that not so much easier? And half the time, we abbreviate the first word constantly um, in scientific papers. We'll put A, Malfuria. So especially among papers uh, talking about just this stuff. Uh, speaking of papers, we will be actually reading and going over scientific papers together and separately later in this course. So that is coming up. I'm just trying to get a... Uh, list for you so to help you find scientific papers so don't go oh no she's gonna make us read scientific papers yeah i'm gonna teach you how to read scientific papers which means you don't read the whole thing you just get the information and run because that's going to help you later trust me it doesn't matter what course you're going into knowing how to research and find the information is half the battle ai can't do everything yet yet. Anyway, so Linnaeus worked out a broad system of classification, uh, which basically looks like this. We go from the biggest non-specific all the way down to the very, very, very specific at the bottom here. So similar genera are grouped into a family. Similar families are grouped into an order. Um, orders with similar properties are grouped into a class. Similar classes are grouped into a phylum and phylum with similar traits are grouped into a kingdom. And then the five kingdoms are grouped into either one of three domains. So everything alive is in one of three domains. And we're going to be talking about these guys a lot from here on in. So this isn't like, we, you're probably going, wait, what? Don't worry. We're going to get there. Um, we are going to be breaking down, especially for the rest of the semester, uh, all animals into the five kingdoms. Now, that you could either go with six kingdoms. I'm going to go with five kingdoms because um, one of them is always getting split and sm well, smooshed back together and split and smooshed back together. And I'll get into that why, because it's a weird little dimension. Um but we're pretty much going to split from here on out into the five uh, kingdoms and look at them each individually and break down what makes them different from everybody else. Um, then, and then from there on in, it's it's just a matter of splitting it out. For instance, uh, I've got a cat right here. And so they're in domain eukaryota because they're made up of eukaryotic cells. Domain basically splits us out by cellular type. Uh, so it's uh, archaea, uh, uh, hold on, I have another slide about it in a minute. I don't know why I'm blanking on that right now. Brr. Must be because it's a Monday. So anyway, eukaryota, and then we split out in the kingdom animalia, because cats are animals. Um, we go into phylum. Now, Animalia basically has two phyla. It's either you have a, a, you have a backbone or you don't have a backbone. So vertebrates versus invertebrates. So invertebrates like worms, jellyfish, um, insects, because they don't have a spine. They have an exoskeleton, but they do not have a spine. Um, and then the vertebrates, all of us that have a spine. And of course, cats have spines, just like me. Just like my snake, Monty, he also has a spine. So he's in cordata, which means you get a spine. You have a spine and you and you. Anyway, and then class mammalia, because they're covered in fur, they give live birth, and they have milk to feed their babies with. But they're in order carnivora in that they eat meat, um, especially cats. They're true carnivores in the fact that they... Uh, really can't eat anything else. I mean, I've seen cats, you know, they eat grass, but that's usually to get a little bit of roughage to clear out their tummies if they need the help with that. And they're in family Philidae with the rest of the cats. Um, and then they're in uh, genus Panthera. And then this one is Panthera partis. So that is our naming and that's how we do now how do you remember this how do you remember these classes well i remember it from the old uh dear king philip came over for great sex um technically or soda another one is dear king philip came over for grape soda i don't know why i've always gone with the lewd one 
because that's the one that's stuck in my tiny little brain. And it did it helps. I find it helps. Um hey, whatever works, works. You know what I mean? So there's a there's a lot of different ways you can remember the mnemonic. Um, there's a ton on the internet you can look up. Anyway, let me stick myself back up there. Okay. So let's go ahead the three domains. So archaea, these are single-celled prokaryotic uh, organisms. They're normally found in extreme environments. We're going to talk about them quite a bit um, in one of our sections. Um, they're like crazy. Uh, they really do survive in the strangest places. Um, usually you find them like in uh, around uh, thermal vents. Um, we found some exoskeleton, some some remnants of them on asteroids, for gosh sakes. Um, we think there is one line of thought uh, that says life possibly came from these guys escaping some explosion on Mars and landed here and then started life out from this. I, you know, take that as you will. Um, just a thought. I, I, I'm i not sure how backed up that research is at the moment. It's just one of those lines of thought. Where did life come from on Earth? That was one of the lines of thought that we could be escapees from Mars. So are we really the Martians? Dun, dun, dun. Anyway. Um, so these guys, like, uh, uh, also you find them in, like, acidic hot pools. You uh, find some of them, like, in the Dead Sea. You think the Dead Sea is dead? No, these guys are living in it because they like, uh, they're called haleophiles because they love salt. Uh, hail is a term for, uh, another term for salt. So they're called haleophiles. They hang out in the salt, the insane salt that would kill anything else in the, in the, the Dead Sea going, Weather's fine. Come on in. Um, so these guys live in places anything else would be dead in. So they're they're an interesting bunch. Bacteria is another fun bunch. We're definitely going to be talking about bacteria, both good and bad. Bacteria used to be our number one enemy before we came up with things like antibacterials, although they're on the rise again because bacteria learn fast, even though they're single cell little crazy things but we also learn a lot of things from them like CRISPR technology and stuff like that so we have a lot to learn from them and we also have to learn to continuously keep defending ourselves from them and then there's a uh, eukaryota which is what we are we are uh, all the organisms made up of one or more eukaryotic cells these have a nucleus they have the organelles so remember these guys are protists they do not have organisms. They, I mean, yeah, they do not. They are organisms. They do not have nuclei. Um, their DNA is all loosey goosey. Um, whereas the eukaryotic, we have the, you know, the organelles like the mitochondria and the chloroplast and the plants. These guys, you know, some of them have some of these things. Some of them don't. They're, they're. It's an interesting mix. So these are prokaryotes. Eukaryote, uh, eukaryota is a eukaryote. Now, um, how we like to split things. Currently, we're pretty happy in this dimension right now. The bio, uh, we usually live in the three domain system. You got bacteria, archaea, and then eukaryota. And then we break it down from there. Uh, and that's kind of what we're going to do. Um, technically, the six kingdom, the six kingdom system is kind of like taking the three kingdom, three domains and smashing it together with the traditional five kingdom. So we're going to be bouncing a little bit. I split them out a bit. So therefore, we're going to be doing archaea, bacteria, and then we'll be looking at protista, uh, plant, fungi, animal. I actually will probably flip flop the plant and the fungi. We'll do fungi first, then plant, then animal. That's how we're going to look at it. So we're going to like a little bit do the, the three domain system. But the eukaryota, we're going to split back into protista, fungi, plant, and animal. So that way, that's how we're going to carry forward. So that's basically how you can split these guys out. He came out with the the five kingdom system because he just, you know, slammed all the uh, pro all the uh, a lot of the prokaryotes in Monera. And then it wasn't until DNA testing that we said, wow, yeah, we should split this up into bacteria and archaea. So it's still, trust me, it's still a fight in biology. Um, when it comes to classification, you'll notice 
there's always somebody fighting over the classification of something. If not, we wouldn't have um, people who like to classify in biology. They'd be out of a job. So it's kind of a running joke. Um, you know, the people that like to classify life in biology, they're always looking for something to pick it apart to drive the rest of us in biology absolutely crazy. Uh, but it does make for interesting fights uh, during um, during uh, uh, conferences, I'll tell you that much. Apparently, the, the last fight I heard about over classification was if um, horseshoe crabs, which are related to spiders, but they're kind of their own separate thing, if we shouldn't be putting them in with the spiders, which is kind of like, no, but... So there was a big snaf uh, snafu over uh, one um, uh, scientist arguing that horseshoe crabs should be put in with the spider family and most traditionalists sitting there going, no. So, so yeah, this is, this is how, this is how nitty gritty some of these fights can be, which is actually usually very amusing for those of us that are kind of not really wanting to fight about classification that hard. It's like, Okay. And that's why you know DNA has definitely helped and hindered in a lot of places. So yeah, DNA has helped us out considerably. And like when DNA first came out, we had to reorganize a lot of creatures. Like for instance, we didn't know, genetically speaking, that cheetahs are actually genetically closer to our mountain lions in North America than they are to any other cat. So that kind of blew our minds when we were looking at the genetics because we kind of had them a little differently. Um, and then we brought the DNA, when we discovered DNA, brought DNA testing into it. It was like, wait, mountain lions and cheetahs are closely related? How did that happen? So we've hit a lot of that. You know, we've hit a lot where the DNA says, hey, these guys are very closely related. And when, then we sit there and go, how? So yeah, studying evolution and classification and yeah, DNA uh, definitely opened up, helped us a lot, also made us go, huh? And had, we had to rewrite quite a bit. So it's a beautiful thing about science. We are open to change and that's a good thing. All right. Well, we're open to informed change. So there's a difference. So anyway, so let's talk about Phylogeny. So this is the evolutionary history relationship of an organism or group of organisms. So this is basically our thoughts or our, you know, hypotheses and theories of how these guys are related, especially now that we have, uh, uh, you know, DNA testing behind us and everything and stuff like that. It definitely shows us who's related to who and possibly who came before who or who arose at the same time, but split. Keep in mind, not everybody, you know, it's not like a step ladder. And you're going to see that with these phylogenic trees, which are diagrams used to reflect evolutionary relationships between organisms or groups. So unlike the, the thing where we've got like a step, you know, ladder that, you know, it's like, this came from this, this came from this, this came from this, it, you'll see instead where it splits and you'll see that, yeah, they split, but it wasn't necessarily that they had come before. It's like they are like, you know, one will they'll split and then like several will split off one line and then not the other line. It's an interesting, it's very interesting. So there's a couple of ways you can draw these things. Um, you can root them. So this is a rooted where it basically has the one common ancestor. Now keep in mind, and I'm gonna break this down in the next slide. This means when they're coming together like this, this means it wasn't that creature that we're looking at. It was a common ancestor that split at some point. So a rooted is basically coming out of a single ancestral lineage. And it's usually typically drawn from the bottom um, or left. They like to draw it from the left. Um, which all organisms uh, re can relate to this guy as a founding, you know, founding uh, life form that gave rise to all these guys. Um, on the other hand, you can do an unrooted tree where basically uh, it, it's in the middle and you can spin it around in a big circle. That was kind of the ones I was showing um, at the uh, beginning slide. If I go all the way back, you can see this one's uh, kind of a rooted. Woo! 
And this one is actually just one part of an unrooted. These things can get like psychotically crazy. I actually, there's a 3D model that I've been trying to look for the picture. I have it as a poster. It's a great poster. Um, but I can't find it, but it's a 3D model of an unrooted phylogenic tree of all life on earth. And it's mind boggling how crazy it is, especially when you look at the three domains and you see that archaea and bacteria are way, way bigger than eukaryotes. Like out of the three, the way it branches in a circle, the two that take up the most space is the archaea and the um, bacteria. They're huge. There's like gazillions of these creatures. And then all of us eukaryotes are in this teeny bitty cluster. So yeah, we're we're outgunned, outmanned and by the archaea and the bacteria. There's a lot more of them than there is of us. So freaky. So let's go back, go back, go back. So there you go. So that's a rooted tree with a common ancestor at one point and an unrooted tree where it, you can kind of see it more looks like a top down kind of thing. It just depends on how you want to look at it. And sometimes it's easier to look at it one version than the other version. So it's a, it's a matter of how many do you have and how much would you like to destroy your brain? So now in a rooted tree, the branching indicates evolutionary relationships. So the point where a split occurs is called a branch point. And this represents basically what we were talking about last week with speciation and stuff like that. It's uh, where a single lineage evolved into a distinct new one. So um, we call the, uh, you know, we call the lineage that evolved early from the root that remains unbranched a basal taxon. So as you can see right here, so here's the root, um, Right here, some speciation must have happened at some point. And the creatures that, you know, did not change went this way into the basal taxon. And then the creatures that did change into new species went on and split again right here into two, two new species. So we call uh, two lineages stemming from the same point sister taxa. So in this case right up here, Again, we've got a split from a common ancestor right here, a branch, but then it splits again and goes into new paths. And those are sister taxa, which is why it's like, you know, why I get so annoyed when somebody's like, well, the evolution says we came from monkeys. It's like, no, it doesn't because we are actually, if you look at a phylogenic tree of all the hominids, A, we're the only hominid left. And I'll get to why in a bit. Um, but B, they're kind of like uh, a six a sister taxa of way further down. So like, remember, um, a lot of the species that are with us on this planet right now are just as modern as we are. Doesn't necessarily mean, you know, we came from the same branch. Actually, they're like several branches down, so they're not even. So it's interesting. And like I said, right here, so note that although Sister Tax and uh, Ptolemy do share an ancestor does not mean that the groups of organisms split or evolve from each other. And that's what I'm trying to say with that we did not come from monkeys. <laughs> they, they split a long time ago and went in their own direction. And we were split and went in our own direction. And therefore, we did not come from monkeys. Not at all which is why me and one of my former high school teachers are going to go at it one of these days because he would sit there and just, it's a long story. Anyway, you know, you've had those teachers that sit there and try to pick fights with their students for some deranged reason. And you're just like, but why? You know, it's like, anyway, he was one of those. So yeah. So that's basically, so a branch with more than two lineages is called a polytony. So this is him right over here. Hello, polytony. So that splits a lot. So he, he split not just once, he split lots. So that means there was some really interesting pressure happening right here for him to split into several different dimensions. So remember, just because they share a common ancestor does not mean they evolved from each other. Okay, keep that in mind going forward. That's another major misconception of how all this stuff works.
And I'm here hopefully to help you clear up these misconceptions. So you can sit there and go out and go, yeah, that's that's not what that means. So now also to explain another few things, because you're going to see this a lot where like two creatures come up with similar uh, designs like wings, for instance, we've got a lot of different types of wings. We've got insect wings, we've got bird wings, we've got mammal wings. When you talk about bats, we've got the gliders and the squirrels, where they just have the you know the extra skin that helps them grab the air and like gently fly down. Um, that's why squirrels, you know, can live up in the in the treetops and run around like psychopaths because they're built for it. So. And you're like, but bats and birds are not related. And it's true, they're not, because bats are a mammal and birds are birds. Um, we'll talk about that hot mess later because birds are actually came out of the dinosaurs. So, you know, fun stuff. So when you're looking at a chicken, you're actually looking at the descendant of a, of a raptor, one of the, uh, not, I don't know. I, yeah, I think it's a velociraptor. So yeah, hmm velociraptor nuggets anyway so again same thing here so we've got uh, so analogous structures are different structure but similar functions and that's like bird wing versus bat wing so uh you know it, they both achieve flight but they're both completely different from each other as you can see the different types of fins down here uh, a shark fin um is just really fancy cartilage a, burr, a penguin fin actually does have similar bones to our own arms because, uh, well, actually, no, more similar to birds. So it is basically, you know, it's a chicken wing, excuse me. It's more similar to a chicken wing, but it's in the form of a flipper. And then the dolphin, now this is the one I was getting confused here. Of dolphin, if you look at it and you check out the bones, it's kind of analogous to our hands. That's what's called a hom homologous structures. So for instance, in us mammals, you'll see this in where we've got, you know, the ulna and the radius and, you know, the, tar uh, the tarsals and the metatarsals. Again, you'll see it in a cat. Again, you'll see it in the whale. It's just truncated and, you know, elongated to turn into a flipper. And again, you'll see it in a bat. You get, because we are all mammals, but we have different variations to achieve what we needed to survive in nature. So bats have very elongated, skinny fingers or, uh, tar or uh, phalanges, that's what these are called, phalanges, compared to ours, which are built for picking things up and manipulating things. Bats are very long and thin to make that web so they can fly. Uh, whereas whales are long and uh, long and chunky to make uh, have all that nice resistance so they can use that to swim. Um, so homologous structures, you'll see that between everybody living in the same kind of family, actually, if not order. Uh, whereas analogous structures, as you'll see this in completely unrelated species, but they came up with the same solution of a flipper or a wing. Um, so that's the difference between a homologous structure and an analogous structure, which is actually how, unfortunately, I memorized bones. Um, I was taking a zoology class with dear old Dr. Bruce. Uh, at Western Carolina University, uh, he was he was a stickler, man. He was one of the old school professors that really, <laughs> trust me, you got books that were dry as dry could be, no pictures except for like graphs or something. Um, oh boy. And, um, you know, he, he believed that you needed to like study 24 seven to, to make sure that you passed his class. I remember for uh, spring break uh, that year, I was taking his class. It was during spring semester and he handed us each a box. And he said, you've got to memorize the entire contents of this box. You're having a test the minute you get back from spring break. And I was just like, what? Well, Open the box. It was an entire disassembled cat skeleton. And that is how I memorized skeletons. Because if you memorize a cat skeleton, it's pretty much homologous to a human skeleton because we're both mammals. We have a lot of similar parts. They're just in a slightly different formation because cats are four-legged and we're, of course, two-legged. So our, you know, there's there's differences between the two because of this. 
So that's homologous structures. And that's why I know the skeleton the skeletal system way, way, way too well. Excuse me. Anyway. And you know, hitting professors like that, it's it's rough. <laughs> I, I survived that class barely. Woo! Good old Dr. Bruce. He, he put your third heck. So now, how do we keep this all straight so we can sit there and go out into, you know, like I said, I was kind of a field uh, person myself for a long time. So if you're a field person and you're going out and you're catching a lot of critters and then you what you do is you normally bring them back to the lab with you uh, to study there or to do whatever there, you have to uh, figure out what they are. And we've come up with the most infuriating, but also this is the best way to do it. There is no way around it called the dichotomous key. The dichotomous key <laughs> is basically, it's the reason it has die. Again, die means two, die or buy mean two. And it's two choices. There's two choices. I don't know because it's been a minute. If anybody remembers what choose your own adventure books were, they were books that you would read through and it would hit a page and it said, well, if you want to go, you know, through the door, go to page 32. If you want to, uh, you know, turn around and go down the stairs, go to page 54. And this was true. It was a called Choose Your Own Adventure. You would read along as the character and you would choose what they would do and it would change the, the path of the story. And you could always go back and like some of them would, you know, get you killed. Some choices would get you killed in the book. It was an interesting thing. Um, now it's, you know, put into a lot of video games these days. You know, the choice, the choice trees, like I'm trying to think of like, uh, uh, God, my brain. Mass Effect. Um, you get those choice trees. Dragon Age, I think. I've played the Mass Effects. I haven't played Dragon Age. But a lot of the choices you make in video games these do now are having repercussions later on. So it's like a choose your own adventure book. And it's basically the same thing, except less thrilling and less interesting. Um, and that is a dichotomous key. Now, dichotomous keys are our bread and butter, especially for those of you that were going, said you're going to go into zoology. Yeah, you're going to you're going to have some di uh, dichotomous key fun. And for instance, I'm going to show you one of my dichotomous keys that I used quite a bit when I study spiders. And that is right here. This is the spiders of North America. And as you can see, he's pretty thick. Now, this isn't the thickest dichotomous key I've ever used. Actually, this one's nice and moderate. Uh, the thickest I've ever used is for aquatic uh, insects. And oh my God, there are, yeah. They are absolutely positively the thickest dichotomous key I've ever used and the most one that makes you want to cry. So they're honestly the best thing to use and the most crazy thing to use. And I'll show you how. So really quickly, and I'm going to make a longer video on how to do a dichotomous key later uh, and upload that hopefully by Wednesday because I want to make sure I go over this properly, but I don't want to make you go, uh, after, you know, all, me going through these notes and everything and you going, I want you guys to, uh, you know, have a break, have a bit of a brain break, and then I'll do a longer dichotomous key to show you how it works. So basically, let's do a quickie short one right here is you always, 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 always start at number one. I don't care. What if you're on number five bird, doesn't matter. You always start at number one and it always gives you two choices and you have to look at the animal and this is where your eyes start crossing because if you're using a dissection microscope, this is where you start going crazy. But you look at the animal and say we want to figure out bird W right here. So we get take a good look before we even start. We take a good look. We see it has a long, big beak, kind of has a straight under edge right here, stuff like that. So we look at number one and we get two choices. So we go, the beak is relatively long and slender or the beak is relatively stout and heavy. It is very, very uh, term heavy. So make sure you understand by Googling, you know, and see what terms mean what. So like A right here, is it long and slender? 
no no not really long and slender i don't think so it's very stout and heavy it's a it's a big it's a chunky beak so we choose b and we go to the dot 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 says go to two okay so you go to number two you do not skip steps. You tell you says, says go to two. You go to two. You do not pass go. To, you do not collect two hundred dollars. So the bottom uh, surface of the lower beak is flat and straight, or the bottom and always read both. Even if you think, well, yeah, it's it's flat and straight, so it's got to be that. Always read both. Don't skip. It will bite you in the posterior. Trust me. I've done it. I've rude the day I did it. I wasted my time. Never skip. Always read the second, even if you think it's the first. The bottom surface of the lower beak is curved. As you can see, it's straight. It's definitely not curved. So therefore, if we look at it, so the bottom of the surface of the lower beak is flat and straight. It's geospreza. Okay, so this is a geospreza bird. So let's try again with bird. Uh, let's uh, try again with bird Y here. So this one is one, the beak is relatively long and slender and you could go, yeah, but remember, always read the second option. Don't don't go, I got it because sometimes you'll go down later and you, you'll find something else that goes, oh wait, trust me on this one. So the beak is relatively stout and heavy. No, it's long and slender. So I guess he's a Certhidia, okay? So he's a Certhidia. So again, you could do this with each of the birds. You can do it with Z, start at number one. Beak is long and slender. No, the beak is relatively uh, stout and heavy. Yeah, it's pretty stout. The bottom surface of the lower beak is flat and straight. The bottom lower is curved. Nope, that's, that's curved, that's curved. So go to three. The lower edge of the upper beak has a distinct bend. The lower edge of the upper beak is mostly flat. Nope, that's got a bend to it. And this has got a bend to it. So he's got a bend. So he is a Camarynchus. Camarynchus. Yeah, I can read. And then, you know, again, but now imagine this with missing parts, because when I had to do this with aquatic insects, I'm going to tell you right now, this is where the pain comes in, because when you catch them, and then unfortunately, yes, you have to kill them to preserve them. So you throw them in some isopropyl alcohol. So they, yeah, they they have a nice alcohol of death. But anyway, um, you bring them back and because of the transport and everything, and because they have very delicate parts, things fall off. So you're sitting there looking at has so many gill flaps and two of the gill flaps have fallen off and you have to sit there and know where the gill flaps were is so you can count where the gill flaps were, not the gill flaps that are visible. It's It can get really painful, but I want you to be able to do a dichotomous key. That's the point I would like to get across to you this week is how to read and do a dichotomous key because for those of you that are going further, especially in zoology or any other, even botany, this these books you will be hitting dichotomous keys. They will come back. And so knowing how to read one is half the battle. And even then you've got to get used to the quirk of the dichotomous key itself. Like this one, there was a couple of things I could skip, but there's a lot of things I can't. So it's, like I said, I want you to be able to read and do a dichotomous key by the end of the week. And if you need help with that, please find me. Remember, I am always over in the lab, uh, patent 223. Uh, for you to, you know, come on in and ask me questions and nail me down if you need that. So remember that. Um, I believe that's everything I want to go over in these notes today. Yay. Yeah. Um, so I'll escape out of that. So remember, um, I'm going to have two more videos, interactive videos coming up. Uh, here's one right here, taxonomy. Um, crash course taxonomy. Um, I'm hope you I hope you're liking the videos. Um, I'm trying to get to where I can make some interactive worksheets for you too. So you could choose if you don't like the videos as much, you could do the interactive videos instead. I'm trying to work to that to where you can choose what you want for a grade or what you want to do for a grade. Um and like I said, I'm gonna be putting up a dichotomous key. I'm still trying to find one that A is, you know, won't kill you, but also will challenge you. I don't want to destroy you 
but I do want you to be at least go, oh, okay, and be challenged, but not to the point of tears. There's a, there's a happy medium. I, I don't want to destroy you, but I want at the same time to make sure that you've got this. You see what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, uh, which is why I'm not giving you my spider dichotomous key as a worksheet because <laughs> no, <laughs> that would be cool. So like I said, two more interactive videos are going to be coming up. I'm going to be working on them. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Using all three of my brain cells. Oh. So I hope you like the, uh, you know, I'm always open for feedback. Please, you know, shoot me a message through Remind. If you, uh, you know, like or dislike the videos, let me know. I've got some, I've got some good feedback. Thank you. Um, and other than that, uh, if you need anything, just let me know and, uh, or come on down to Patton, find me and sit on me and I'll teach you what you want to know. Uh, I think that's everything. So remember, uh, read the chapter, do the lab. Oh yeah. With the labsters. I know they're finicky as all get out. And I apologize for that. It's just the way labster is make sure everything has been updated before you run them. Okay. So make sure if you're doing a Chromebook, make sure Chrome is updated, make sure the Chromebook is updated because if it isn't at the peak of updatingness, labster will do terrible things. Um, trying to think. Yeah. Should be four videos this week, interactive videos to do. Uh, the weekly quiz. So remember that shuts every Sunday at midnight. Um, and I should put some resources at the bottom if you just want to check things out. And there should be a dichotomous key for you to do. Like I said, I'm trying to figure out how to do it interactively so you don't have to waste paper and print it out, but we'll see. It might be something you have to print out, do on paper, which might be easier for you. And then you take a picture and upload it to me. And I say, oh, I've got it. And you get a 100. And so it might be that too. I don't know. I'll make a decision on Wednesday. And like I said, I'm planning on putting out another video on in more detail on how to read dichotomous keys. Although I do have a video with the Amoeba sisters that also goes over it too. So it's an easy concept until you apply it to a big, dichotomous key and that's when the uh, crying starts so that's why i want to do kind of a large one as an example with you or a large ish one so you can see what's going on with these things so because they're very very important tools in biology okay with that said uh thank you for coming um and i'll uh see you next week if i don't talk to you before then so you guys take care take it easy and party on Bye.